what the world is watching with their ears. If you record audio for any purpose, chances are you want it to be heard. You want to attract the largest audience possible who can hear your message. That's where we come in. We're CyberEars.com, a revolutionary Internet service that will host your audio files and help you promote and track its popularity. Considering hosting a podcast to the world? We have all the automated tools to make the process as simple and easy as it can be. No technical mumbo-jumbo to work out. CyberEars.com does all the work for you. You record it. We take care of the rest. So don't delay. Go to CyberEars.com today and register for a free trial account. Upload your audio files and get heard. With CyberEars.com, it's your audio on your terms. Hey, Paratopia, it's Jeff Ritzman and Jeremy Vaney, along with you again on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. Did I cover it, Paul? <laughs> How was that? That was good, yeah. See, you, you don't know when they're listening. You get it? That's pretty yeah. slick, right? right? And uh, tonight, you guys better strap in. Or strap on. <laughs> what? <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> Sorry. I knew it was coming. Uh, it's a freewheeling chat tonight with, uh, Mr. Philippe Mora. Dr. Mora. Dr. Mora. Von Mora. Mora. Yes, Von Von Mora. Von Mora. And he shall whip you if you do not refer to him as Von Mora. Uh, we'll be on hand to discuss, uh, his latest film. And, uh, which, what's the name of that film, Jeremy? The God Files. Great. Which I watched. The YouTube video of (laughs) the trailer. And I'm only going to say, uh, (laughs) um, uh, um, and Mr. Mora, a very good friend of the show. So he's back to discuss all of these things and a whole, whole lot more as we delve into what episode is this? Uh, that would be 98, Jeff. Thanks for coming coming to the meeting this week. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm not on the production team. I just work here. So without further ado... Wait, shouldn't we have further ado? I don't know, should we? Yeah, you didn't tell one, me any, what's one, the other further ado? One te- little tidbit of further ado. This week, this this upcoming week, not the week that we're in now, but next week, perhaps a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday of right. next week. Uh-huh. You know, next week. Right. You understand the definition of next week, right? I think so. I don't need to explain it any further than this. I don't feel well. <laughs> anyway, next week, uh, we will be releasing Upon the World the cover story and a supplementary article of Paratopia Quarterly, along with the cover, for free. Right. And then the actual magazine will be out uh, later at the end of the month. Hmm. Um, so, get ready, folks, because this is going to be a game changer, I think. Uh <laughs> I mean, I'm already hearing stuff privately about it from private people who say private things. So imagine what public people are going to say publicly. <laughs> well, that wasn't uh, cryptic. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I, could, I don't know how much more clear you can make it. <laughs> um, if you thought the David Jacobs thing was scandalous. No, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, what do we say? I, 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 we've sort of been teasing this. Um, so we'll just go with one more tease of, I think that this is the other nail in the coffin of alien abduction research. Pure and simple. And if you don't get it by, by the end of the entire issue of Paratopia Quarterly, I mean, I think you'll get it probably in the two articles that we're giving to the world for free. But, uh, if not, I think after, at the end of the entire issue, you'll see why exactly there's plenty of reason to move on and, and forge anew, start anew uh, in whatever way possible. Right. 
Well, and I think we should uh, kind of preface all this by saying that this is a uh, it's an article that was not written by us. Uh, that was uh, essentially approached us. I mean, this was brought to us by a very <laughs> insanely credible source and uh, and a named source. So, what you're going to be reading is um, is someone else's writing and not our own. So. Um, we're just uh, making it available to all, and good that this is the cover story is going to be free. But everything else, like Jeremy said, will be available in totality at the end of the month, and I'm I'm pretty excited about all of that too. So yeah, but make sure everyone do your due diligence if you are as floored by what you read as we are. Um, please spread it around. Please give it to everyone you can. Right. Um, I think it's important that this stuff gets out there. And not just, again, swept under the rug or forgotten about or whatever. I mean, don't give it to your dry cleaner if he's not been abducted by aliens, but everybody else. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Don't give it to your dry cleaner. Those are sage words of advice, Jeff. Thanks. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's what goes into a week. Right. Okay. Did I mention I don't feel well? (laughs) You did. Hey, (laughs) Philippe Moore is here. Should we say hi? I think we should, because we had adieu, but, but the adieu is now over, so we're moving on. Thank you. Can I be in charge for a while? Philippe Moore, everybody. Peritopia, it has been a long time coming since we, we, we finally now have uh, Philippe Mora back on the program, who is, of course, Jeff's and my favorite director ever of Communion. Uh, Philippe, thank you for coming back on the program. No, it's my pleasure, and um, I've got my um, alien abduction chastity belt on. Do you know? Just in case. Oh, <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> good. Well, that that's good. That'll help yeah. keep, keep keep them away. But because you may be getting you know unwanted attention from aliens. <laughs> this is true, right. and we all know that vaginal nailed opening on that is a is a real well, stop. I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't I wasn't going to go there, but <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll go there. Uh, so when last you were on the program, you, you briefly mentioned that you were working on uh, a movie about remote viewing, and then I saw that you had a trailer of sorts for this movie. Uh, so let's let's get into this. You, you've changed the name of it, right? So it's it's now called The God Files. Right. Um, what is the movie? What is the trailer? First of all, let's talk about this trailer before we talk about the movie. Are you, are you talking about the trailer on YouTube? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, let me. I what inspired say, um, such a trailer, sir? <laughs> uh, let Let me say this uh, for just to take a step back here. the The film uh, originally it really never had a title. It was about remote viewing, and briefly, the plot of the movie uh, is that in 1945, uh, uh, the war's just ended. The OSS is turning into the CIA. And a group of operatives, let's call them, decide that they are going to spend a lot of money finding out whether God exists or not. Because if they can find out whether God exists, then they can destroy communism once and for all. Because it won't be a debate anymore. And uh, so they try and figure out you know, how they're going to find out whether God exists. Well, pretty soon it takes them into, we call it remote viewing now, but uh, it takes them into psychics, remote viewers, anything to do with psychic, astral travel, whatever. What they're trying to do is send people back to the crucifixion and the resurrection and come back to them and report on what they see. The, the film started out, I'm calling it a strange Lovian film for the following reason. The film started out, shall I say, as a serious study of all of this. And as we got into it, it got funnier and funnier, even though it was, it's a terribly serious subject. It did get funnier and funnier. So that's exactly what happened uh, with Dr. Strangelove. They started out making a serious film about the end of the world, and it, and it became funny, and Kubrick turned it into kind of a comedy. So my film is it's not a comedy, but there are inevitably humorous aspects to it. Is the it background a of all, No, it's a okay. feature film. The... The background of all of this is I had been seriously researching uh, mind control documents that have been released under the Freedom of Information Act by CIA, FBI, Defense Department, 
because incredibly, or not, as the case may be, depending on your opinion, the U.S. government was doing a huge amount of research into mind control as soon as the Second World War ended. They picked up on, they had, the Nazis were doing a lot of research into this as well, and of course the Soviets were. So as part of the Cold War uh, fight and research, uh, the U.S. wanted to make sure that if the Soviets were doing mind control, we would be totally up to date as well. So that, that's the background. And then you probably you've heard of MK Ultra, I'm sure, and all these programs. But they spent millions on all of this. So that's the background to my movie. Um, is there anything real about wanting to uh, prove God to prove the communists wrong, or is that uh, a fictional device? That's uh, artistic license on my part. Okay. Um, now, as far as remote viewing goes, it's interesting, um, and I'm glad you've come back now, uh, because I've been thinking about it lately. Um, someone told me that Ed Dames, who's a big, famous remote viewer, um, had remote-viewed Santa Claus. Somebody gave him Santa Claus to remote view, and not knowing what it was that he was viewing, he saw basically somebody uh, attacking homes. He saw it as sort of a, I don't know, in terms of espionage and that sort of thing. And now a brief timeout to correct myself. Ed Dames didn't do the remote viewing. A couple of remote viewers did the remote viewing and presented their data to Ed Dames, who then made it out to be some sort of terrorist attack on American homes. (laughs) But that snafu doesn't negate any of the questions or concerns that I have that follow. Time back in. Which leads me to ask, is all of this remote viewing stuff simply psychically honing in on whatever the suggestion is? and then pulling out of the ether information uh, about it, whether it's fictional or not, so that you're not actually viewing anything real necessarily, just sort of psychically picking up on what the well, look, that's person still is asking open, you to pick up on. That, that, that's still an open question. There was a very small success rate in terms of what you could say was you know scientifically proven or accurate remote viewing. If they'd get to... A man or a woman in different, usually guy, usually men in two different rooms, give them the same coordinates, and occasionally they came back with the same information or very close, the same kind of drawings. But as I, no one really knows what happened or why they closed it down. But from what I gather, this is the historical part. From what I gather, they were when this started leaking out somehow they government was concerned about themselves being ridiculed and why are you spending all this money on this kooky, weird stuff? So they closed it down. Prior to that, because these programs were being funded by the government, there was congressional, there were congressional hearings apparently on remote, secret congressional hearings on remote viewing, wondering uh, with the aim of finding out where this money was being spent. And as I understand it, that's why they came up, that's why the Army, the Defense Department, came up with the remote viewing manual. Have you seen that Uh, or heard about it? I don't think I have. Jeff, have you? There's something called the Uh, the Defense Department remote viewing manual. It's on, you can find it on the net. And that was a document created to show this congressional investigation what they were doing and how they were doing it because to get money, you have to have, for the Defense Department to get money, you have to have a document which shows exactly what you're doing. So this remote viewing manual is quite interesting, and it explains how they would how they do it. So is there anything in the manual that differentiates it from what what you would just call ordinary psychic ability? Well, it's, inter- it's, it's humorous because it's psychic ability translated into military kind of language and how you find the coordinates, and they didn't want to use the word psychic. That's what they, they invented the term remote viewing. It sounds more military. Right. This whole thing, uh, as you guys know, remote viewing, astral travel, psychic ability, extrasensory, channeling, it's all the same thing. This was just an offshoot on it, and I think the remarkably interesting aspect of it is it was uh, financed in a, in a secret program with a military application, which is a pretty you know, extraordinary thing. Well, it's perfectly possible, although there's no evidence of it, and this is just speculation on my part, that they're still doing it. Because police still use psychics to find bodies and that kind of thing, because every now and then they um, 
they find the body. Yeah. Uh, can I ask the, uh, when we're talking about remote viewing and we talk about coordinates that these people are given, am I right in assuming that these coordinates actually don't mean anything? That these are just numbers picked out in a certain sequence by the uh, facilitator of, uh, of who's going to put the question to the remote viewers? Is that correct or am I completely off base with that? No, it well. No, they do have something to do with it. it. It's hard to understand from reading the manual, but in the manual, they'd be, they would be, the coordinates would be, say they wanted to find out whether the Russians had missiles in Siberia. They would put a photo or longitude and latitude coordinates of where they thought these missiles were. And they then they wouldn't say they wouldn't say anything to these remote viewers. They just give them this envelope with either a photo or coordinates or whatever, and they'd say, "Okay, you know, go remote view." And then they'd come back and they'd do drawings of how many missiles were there, or do a drawing of a dog, or whatever. I mean, the whole thing is is kind of crazy. Huh. I mean, how detailed did some of these get? Some of them were very detailed. There's a couple of famous cases of. Uh, R- uh, Russian battleships and stuff, the where they came back with drawings of these battleships huh. and that kind of thing. Okay. So, you know, in the hysteria of the Cold War, they were trying anything. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that says that this kind of thing is still going on at all, anywhere, right now? No, there's nothing. Uh, there's, there, there's nothing. But there's, a, but there's tons of documents on when they were doing it. You know, with all of these programs or, you know, black operations or black, uh, whatever you want to call it, secret, top secret, you, you never know. And we don't really know the extent of how far they went with it. Well, it's, it's interesting to me because it, um, to me, it sort of mirrors the problem of hypnosis, which is if you give a real target like Soviet submarines, well, maybe they'll be able to describe the location. Maybe they'll get a hit. If you give them something unknown, like, you know, alien base on the moon or Santa Claus or something, um, then who knows what they're getting? Um, and it's the same thing. Like, hypnosis, it'll work. We had Whitley Strieber on again recently, and he said um, the forensic hypnotist who worked with him told him after the first couple of times, you're done. Uh, because then you start fabricating a story. You start making stuff up. So it seems like... There's a certain thing that you, you could use hip, hypnotism for in a court of law, maybe, to retrieve memory well, of things that have happened. But then when it comes to these sort of ethereal things, who knows what you're retrieving? Do you think that's well, the same in, you that's, think a parallel? A, I think that's a very pertinent observation because in, the, in this militarized or weaponized, or weaponized maybe too strong a word, but in this militarized remote viewing, the, the viewers were told – to go to this place and not think. They were told to go there, look, come back, and report. They were told to, in other words, to keep any personal, emotional, anything like that out of it. Because sometimes they'd see, they'd go to some place and see atrocities. A few times there's reports of this. Uh, but they were told, whatever you see, don't get emotionally involved. Now, hypnoti- hypnotism, I think, is all over the place, uh, as you were just suggesting. And the the remote viewing, the remote viewing, I, it's kind of a hypnotism, I guess. I don't know. I think it's all the same thing. It's all using part of the brain that um, many people believe we have that isn't used. Hypnotism, of course, uh, was studied by the CIA and and you know sort in, de- of in depth, in depth, and, and created to uh, as a behavior modification tool. Um, so. I mean, you knew you must have known this way back when. Did did it worry you when you started seeing it used as a regression uh, therapy tool? Yeah, I think it's all. I think it. Uh, well, not all. I think most of this stuff is just quackery, um, as Jeremy you pointed out in that excellent article. But the po- thing is, you only need one incident that's that's real to make it real. It's like you know you can have. 500,000 fake UFO or alien abduction sightings, but if there's one real one, that's all that counts. We're still looking for that one real one in terms of conventional 
scientific proof. But so it does, I mean, all the quackery and fakery and all the rest of it, I, it doesn't mean anything if, if this if, if these things really events or people or aliens or whatever these things actually exist. We just need one really good incident, right? So this, I think the same applies to hypnosis. Uh, in that, you just need one really good. Well, the question is, can you you know bring forth a trustable one trustable really good memory? Yeah, but look, the mind control thing is slightly different. What the what the the CIA was doing and the MK Ultra and all that stuff, they they were really uh, working on the Manchurian Candidate. Uh, uh, stuff. They were trying to. They were putting. Pe- they were putting people into deep comas, any way they could, and they were programming them. And the hypnotism was just like in that movie. You know, I think they show like Ace of Spades or something, and it triggers an instruction. That's what they were doing in MK Ultra. I mean, that's described in documents now. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this, uh, because Jeff and I were uh, wondering about this. Earlier this week, Jim Penniston uh, from the Bentwaters, whatever that is, UFO Landing, uh, who's the one who touched the UFO, he he says that you know he's retrieved some sort of binary code that they, I guess, downloaded him with a binary code of some sort. Uh, but somewhere in his story, the the government said you need to do hypnosis using sodium pentothal. So take sodium pentothal and then do hypnosis. What do you make of that? Do you think that that's that there's some sort of uh, you think they're implanting alien stuff in there? Possibly. I mean, I don't even know I, if you know the answer. I really to this, wouldn't, wouldn't have a cl- I wouldn't have a clue. You mean who who's implanting alien stuff? Uh, whoever so not, the, the government people question. are that are saying, "Hey, uh, you need to do hypnosis in conjunction with sodium pentothal." Like, why would you need to do that? What would do you have any idea what that does? Well. You know, I think we touched on this when we spoke last. There's this whole other theory uh, backed up by some documents at the end of the Second World War and after there was the Psychological Warfare Board, which was a cross-agency, cross-departmental, very sophisticated board, you know, the, the diplom- diplomats, psychiatrists, generals, top secret psychological warfare thing and they were examining ufos and they were looking at films of ufos but what i'm getting at is that the one theory is that this whole ufo thing was a psychological warfare a very clever one created to uh freak out the, Ru- the russians freak to freak out the soviets that we had captured aliens we captured ufos and it was all top secret and that's why they would never deny anything, never confirm, never deny, and so on and so forth. So when you're asking, you know, were they <laughs> implanting stuff, maybe they were with some other weird agenda. Because uh, there's no doubt that uh, it did bother the Russians mm-hmm. when the uh, there was this thing going around, <laughs> you know, after Roswell. The Russians were, they really wanted to know whether we had captured aliens or not because of the, tech, the technological aspect of it. Well, that's a great psychological warfare. Leo. I mean, you can, you know, yeah, let's, let's, let's really freak out the Soviets. Let's get them to think we've got alien technology. Right. So I don't know where all this ended and started and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I I mean, think- my, my best guess is that there was a real phenomena uh, that they manipulated into the whole alien thing uh, so that they could do psychological warfare. Yeah, I, exactly. It could be a bit of, of, of bit of all of the above. I don't think there's any doubt that, that something's been going on. Either way, it's really fascinating, and I guess that's why people like you and I are fascinated by this subject. You know, it's endlessly fascinating. I, I mean, it, it's very difficult because you don't know where the truth starts and ends and and then it's all it's confused by the amount of quackery, let's call it that. Right. And deliberately hoax, deli- you know, deliberate hoaxes and stuff. I mean, it really, unfortunately, muddies the waters, which I think, uh, I think that's why it's so important to expose frauds. Yeah. Uh, uh, un- unknowing frauds or knowing frauds. Uh, as, as far as the remote viewing goes um, and UFOs and that sort of thing, is there anything in there about UFOs or about alleged aliens that struck you as realistic? 
in any of the things? Well, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot in the literature about, uh, uh, you know, the... It gets far fetched. Uh, remote viewing to other planets, or remote viewing, and you know, uh, there's a lot of the, the more of down to earth remote viewing is the more plausible stuff to me. And uh, I haven't, I'd have to refresh my research on this, but the it, it did impress me that some remote viewers would come back and just and they'd be sent to some area where I mentioned atrocities. They'd be knowingly sent. By the uh, by, their control to some area where there was some disaster going on, and they'd, and they'd come back really freaked out and say, "I don't want to do this anymore. I can't do this anymore." Hmm. So whether they whether they were it's just the, the way these re, they're speaking, it just sounds authentic, right? But this, but the more far out stuff, you know, I. I went to Jupiter and there's an incredible mall there and I bought some gravity shoes and all that stuff. That, <laughs> you know, yeah. far-fetched. Uh, but uh, it, look, there's still research going on. I mean, it, this, you know, Scientology initially was involved with remote viewing. Are you aware of all of that? No. There were The, the original uh, Scientologists were doing what they called a form of remote viewing and incredibly, if you do the research on this, some early Scientologists were on the National Security uh, National Security Council early on, and uh, they weren't. There was no one on the on the. This was a, like an internal scandal, and they were eventually they were kicked off. And this is all available on the net. In, you know, not in wacky sites, but on the, the, they were the known names. And the CIA tried to buy Scientology. Are you aware of this? No. <laughs> no. No. Oh, okay. Well, the CIA, Teach us. Scientology started because they had all this mind. That, that Scientology was all about mind control. It probably still is. But in the early days, it was totally about mind control. And that's what the CIA was really interested in because of what the Russian research. So there were people who were Scientologists early, who were on the National Security Council, blah, blah, blah. And at one point, the CIA wanted to buy Scientology, and they wouldn't sell to them. And there was a whole mini scandal about that. And, and and a lot of Scientologists believe that's why the government went after them because they wouldn't give them the the mind control stuff they were doing. Well, how did they go from just being, you know, the dream of a sci-fi writer to a mind control organization? Was that always his intention, L. Ron Hubbard? Yeah, controlling. Well, it's cult, is it? Hey, how do you control people? That's what a cult is. Right. I mean, you know, they, it was a, that's the definition of a cult, is you're controlling people's minds, and there are all kinds of techniques to do it. And they had this, you know, pseudo-scientific way of doing it. Hmm. And in the, in, the, in the middle of the Cold War, that was extremely interesting to the CIA and other organizations in the U.S. government who were concerned about mind control. I mean, all this stuff, of course, backfired. You know, the, the, I mean, famously, the CIA did buy world rights to uh, LSD after it was discovered. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yeah. Okay, so they, they so that, and that was all part of the same program, and, of course, that kind of backfired because what they, they thought LSD would be a mind control thing. It actually was a... Uh, it's a bit, uh, if I can use as a metaphor, the, uh, they also developed a, a gas that would give you instant diarrhea, which they wanted to, which they sprayed on, uh, anti, anti-Vietnam war protesters. A gas that gives you gas? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, double gas, yeah. And, but the, when they used it in Washington, uh, on, well, we don't remember the date of the particular protest, but it's a famous incident. They sprayed it, that the, Police sprayed it, and the uh, the wind changed, and uh, oh. all the police all the police got instant diarrhea. So it's complete oh. flop. So they thought we'll give that up. So, but I think that's a metaphor for all of this stuff. As soon as government gets tr- tries to control minds, it never works. And a brute force works, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah, I'm reading a book now about um, you know neurobiology, sort of as the new wave of uh, defense issues, you know, trying to create super soldiers and all that sort of thing. I mean, you want to talk about Strange Lovian. Uh, you know, where does it end? I mean, we don't even 
we don't even know that we have enemies that care about that stuff anymore. I mean, as far as we know, like everyone's still vying to get the nuke, and we're already on yeah. to like, how do we have super soldiers? You know, it's like, what are yeah. we, what are we defending against at this point? I don't I don't get it. I don't know. Well, you know, we need an enemy. It keeps the economy going. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't you, know. Have you Go spoken? Ahead. Have you spoken to? Uh, you must have spoken to remote viewers. Uh, for part of your research, I have absolutely, and they and they uh, and I won't mention any names, but they they're totally what's the word? They're t- totally down to earth, legit, uh, legit people. Uh, no, you know they're not subscribers to Voodoo magazines or anything. They're they're, they're very down to earth. So some of them were soldiers, and they just they had this ability. Then they didn't know why, what, or whatever, and they did exactly what they were told. They said, go to this place, take a mental picture, and come back and tell us what you saw. And don't get emotionally involved. Hmm. And do you, do you know and roughly that, what they think their hit ratio is? I mean, do, do, do they think it's a good tool to use or, or no? They, they're not that, they weren't self-analyzing like that. They were basically, it was a, 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 just... Re- down to earth is the only thing I can think of. I mean, they were not, they had this ability, they believed that whatever they saw, they actually saw. And 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 when you speak to them, they're not the kind of, they're not the people that go to UFO conferences, let me put it that way. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're, they're, you know. if there, there was a question that I, I missed that I, I should have asked a couple of questions ago, which is when talking about all of this government stuff um mm. what do you think of streber in terms of his family's military background and some of the things he might have suspected um because i think at one point he had mentioned the possibility i don't think he ever said this happened but the possibility that he was part of uh some sort of government experiment uh does that strike you as possible you know him better than than we do i look my gut instinct is no but is it possible? Of course. But I, I really don't. I really. He never mentioned it to me. Hmm. Um, in, well, you know, I know. Didn't he have it? His uncle was Arthur Exxon, right? Who was involved with allegedly Roswell and all that. I mean, it just seems like too yeah. many coincidences after a while where you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Look, I haven't followed those coincidences. Certainly nothing that was what came up when I met Whitley originally, uh, you know, in like 1969 in London. Mm-hmm. And when we were doing communion, that that background, that family background, uh, never came up. But maybe he got into it a bit more, and maybe there's something to it. I, I honestly don't know. In '69, was he talking about any of this stuff? No, he was um, a student at the London Film School, which is where I met him, and we were great friends, and uh, we were talking about everything. You know, mm-hmm. are you still friends? To but this actually, day? it's we're friends. We haven't been in touch for quite a while. Um, but you know, what I was going to say is that in 1969 in London, there was a great, uh, UFO magazine called, um, something like Flying Saucer Quarterly or something or fly, I mean, why, uh, do, do, do you know the magazine I mean? I'm not sure. It was like a serious, one of the first serious UFO, uh, magazines. In fact, I've got a copy right here. The Flying Saucer Review. Oh yeah, yeah. 1972. Yes. And so, the, the, all these, all the, if you, if you go through issues of uh, the Flying Saucer Review from London in those years, every, all these issues that we've been discussing are in those magazines, and that's 40 years ago now. But well written mm-hmm. by you know doctors, uh, lawyers, scientists. Gordon Creighton. Does that name mean anything to you? Um, the editor? I know the name. Gordon Creighton. It, it's actually really worth having a look at. And um, um, this issue I've got here, contents. Brazil learns at last about AVB. The scientists and UFOs, a Turkish report, UFOs over Istanbul, unidentified submarine object off Papua. Serpents and UFOs, are psychic people more likely to see UFOs? Some thoughts on thinking globes. Radiation symptoms in Exodus. It's 1972. Pretty yeah. fascinating, well, really. Well, see, and then this it's fascinating, but it's also sort of the problem of ufology, isn't it? That 
we're still talking about the same thing six years later. Nothing's been solved at all. I mean, I don't know of any other study that's like that, where people just sort of mechanically talk about the same scenarios over and over again. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, if you, I'd like to hear what uh, what Jung would say about this. Maybe maybe he's right. They're just archetypes that we keep bringing up. I don't know. I'd like to think. Oh, there, oh there's one of my favorite ones. I'm just looking in this particular issue. There's that same. Uh, this is one of my uh, Antonio Villas Boas. That you know the Brazilian case. Yeah, that's a fantastic case. This is 1972. There's a big article about it, where he said he was, uh, you know, raped by a green woman, and then he went to a doctor who put a Geiger counter on his penis, and it went off the charts. Well, you know what they say about going green. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not oh, no, I don't. What do you say about going green? I, I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> don't don't <laughs> let me finish that, I mean, please. I'm enjoying this conversation, but as usual, when you get into the subject, it goes in all directions because it. It as you say, the, the, these issues are unresolved. They're tremendously entertaining and um, and and could be deeply profound if we can just make some sense of it. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm, I'm curious if when you were interviewing any of the remote viewers, if anyone at any time brought up uh, psychotronic weapons at all. N- n- no. Nothing? No. They were uh, real mil- military, uh, military mentality in a good sense. They were not making value judgments. They were, not, they were just told me what they did. Okay. Uh, have you come across anything on psychotronic weapons at all in any of the research you've done on any of this stuff? Well, how are you defining psychotronic? There was a case, I don't know if you've heard about it or not, uh, over in Russia, there's a particular area, quite small actually, um, called the M Triangle. And in this place, uh, which is, for all intent and purposes, it's unpopulated, it's just an area of forest uh, with a large clearing in it. But there have been uh, researchers that have gone there that have been um, uh, chased down by essentially amorphous lights that burned them very badly. There's been UFO sightings there of structured objects, not just lights in the sky, uh, both day and night. Strange objects on the ground that don't seem to make sense as far as being a quote-unquote craft. And I talked to a, a Russian ufologist some time ago about this, and he said that uh, nothing had ever had ever come out of the M Triangle that he found particularly interesting. But what documentaries I had seen on it was it was really quite interesting. Um, and, and I'd heard some people talk a while back that it was possible that in this nearby town, which exists almost out of time, it's almost like this town um, out in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere is still in you know 1920. And that they were using these people as testing for psychotronic weapons. And that's what basically started the M Triangle stories. Whether they be some kind of like remnant of brown noise, or uh, which isn't dissimilar from the gas you were talking about, or whether it's, uh, it's not even you something. Said this like, was in Russia. This is in Russia, this particular one? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. they've also but, equated, you know, something, some use of psychotronic weapons I've heard associated with uh, Rendlesham as well. With uh, what? With Rendlesham, with the whole uh, Bentwaters right. Woodbridge thing. I, look, I have no doubt that all this stuff has been going on, and that the uh, uh, military have been experimenting with this stuff big time since since the Second World War, because that the Second World War spawned all this stuff, and the Nazis themselves were doing all kinds of stuff uh, with drugs, particularly, you know, amphetamines were hugely popular in the, in the thirties. No one knew the damage it could cause. And they've, they, uh, so there's all kind of, they were, Nazis were doing all kind anything to do with mind control. The Nazis were very into themselves. And a lot of the, the a lot of those science, uh, the Russians grabbed Nazi scientists, as we all know, and, gra- and um, we grabbed Nazi scientists and of course von braun and the the rocketry that's the high profile stuff but both sides also grabbed a lot of chemists and uh they were deeply involved you know the 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 
atrocious experiments that the uh, Nazi doctors were doing on people in concentration camps involved drugs, mind control, all kinds of you know crazy stuff. I mean, one interesting footnote to that, I know I'm getting a little bit off the track here, but an interesting footnote is that Hitler's doctors, he had quite a few doctors, but uh, I'd say within the last five years, maybe a bit longer, they've published the drugs that uh, Hitler was taking every day. And uh, he was, uh, they've now basically concluded, and there was an introduction by Albert Speer before he died to one of these books on, on uh, Hitler's medications, that Hitler was an amphetamine addict. Oh. And so what, what I'm getting at is there's a whole drug aspect to this that if you were ignorant that people were taking drugs, you could interpret as some kind of psychic channeling or something. I don't mean Hitler himself, but I mean this whole thing. Of it. I, you're talking about a village in Russia. Sure, they may have given them huge doses of LSD. Right, right. You know, they could have given... Well, mind control is the untold story of the 20th century. Governments were obsessed with it. And, and of course, fascism and dictatorship for the, for the obvious reason they wanted to control everything, they were totally into that stuff. Yeah, yeah. My only big problem with, with anybody talking about something like that, I mean, just for instance, you take Bent Waters Woodbridge and you think about the the physical effects that were left behind, the radiation that was left behind, um, you know, several times higher than background, you know, which which is kind of weird. And, and, and I have a problem with that until I go, well, if they want to make a convincing story after the fact... Um, they're certainly going to set the stage, so to speak. They're going to put an object into the, the field for someone to touch, and they're going to um, accentuate that memory with some kind of drug or weapon system or whatever. Yeah. Um, no, look, there's a know. history of this. I mean, you know, there's, there's tragic history to all of this stuff. If we, if we want to go that, down that road of, you know, like, covering it up with weird stuff, but you know, in the early days of atomic testing, they were putting radioactive dust in the atmosphere over big cities. They were, I mean, they would get soldiers to watch atomic bombs going off and they'd say, just put these sunglasses on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the stuff is unbelievable. Uh, a lot of this happened because of, of ignorance. But if you want to take a totally cynical view, you could, you know, yeah, like all this... UFO stuff could be some weird stuff they've been covering up, experiments on people. I mean, yeah. grabbing people, abducting people, giving them drugs, and then putting them back home. We know, for example, that uh, when the CIA were heavily into LSD, this is well documented, I'm not making this stuff up, or it's no news probably to many of your listeners, but famously the CIA... Uh, uh, created a brothel in San Francisco and gave uh, guys who came in for a, a uh, good night out or whatever they thought that was going to happen, gave massive doses of LSD and filmed them behind two-way mirrors to see what the effect of LSD would be. Why, why a brothel? Because the people who went into the brothel, they'd have no comeback. There was no comeback. They'd go into this brothel, have this unbelievable psychedelic experience probably end up nuts and and leave so who you know who knows what was going on right we do know that uh, the uh, infamous richard helms who was in charge one of the cia heads who was in charge of mk ultra destroyed 98 percent or something of, of all the documents relating to mk ultra and all this stuff and human nature being what it is a lot of documents or documents that went to other departments were not destroyed. That's how we know a lot about this stuff. Uh, and stuff's still coming out now. Uh, well, here's the, here's the amalgamation of the two. Have, you, have any of your remote viewing sources ever told you anything about being given drugs and then remote viewing? They specifically said they weren't because I asked them about that. I, I, I asked them, what, you know, what was your diet? And and were you given drug? No. A cup of coffee right. is about as far out as it got. They'd come to work, they called it work, and have a cup of coffee. Huh. So no, they were there. They had a natural ability, or so the military thought, uh, to 
to uh, actually there's a there's a well there's a couple of good books on this. I think one's called Psychic Warrior. There's one poor guy that uh, this affected him terribly badly, and uh, it was a it was a very big program, which is fascinating. Well, after you've talked to these people um, in, in depth as you have, what do you think about? I mean, you see remote viewing workshops, or you used to see them quite a lot. Uh, advertised online or, you know, in the, in the UFO literature stuff, you'd find, you know, there's going to be a, a seminar here where we're going to teach you how to do remote viewing. Do you think that's even a possibility to teach people to do this? Or do you think that it's a, an innate ability that some people have and others don't? Uh, both. There's some people who can naturally do it. And, there's, and, there's, and I think it can be taught definitely. I think we all have the ability to do it. Huh. Some people believe dreams are remote viewing. Yeah, yeah. But there's, there's there's very good books on this out there. I'm, you know, you're familiar with David Morehouse? No, not at all. Yeah, I have David, a bit of Mor- yeah, David Morehouse I mean, did the Psychic Warrior book, did he not? Not, sh- I don't think so. Well, maybe, maybe he. He was did. the one who was hit in the uh, by a bullet that went through his helmet, and he, uh, you know, he ended up alive, but in the psychic program. Yeah, he was trained. <laughs> he was trained in in remote viewing, though, in the protocols of it. Right. I know there's a couple of books out by him. Uh, you see, the thing is, because a lot of this was secret, it, it probably still is to the extent that if they really could do it, yeah, Morehouse was the, did, did write The Psychic Warrior, you're absolutely right, but the secrecy never really ends. And when the, there was a slew of books came out about remote viewing by people who had, been, had signed secrecy agreements, so the logical thing to assume is that someone in the government said, you know, well, let's, let's get this information out there. Let them write books. Because, you know, five, six, seven, eight people wrote books about it all of a sudden. And a lot of this information had been top secret until then. So I don't think we know. Look, it's a frustrating and probably irritating to your listeners, but we don't know really what happened. We just know that the... A defense Intelligence Agency, the CIA, the, the Department of Defense took all this stuff that some people think is far out very, very seriously. Did you read uh, John Ronson's The Men Who Stare at Goats or see the movie? I saw the movie, yeah. Uh, did you think that that was an accurate depiction? No, I, I thought it was amusing, but I thought that uh, it was just like, if you know anything about it, just scratch the surface. Because just for starters, this stuff started in 1945. And that, that film was like, you know, oh, jeez, guys are taking LSD. Do you know what I mean? Right. In Iraq. <laughs> yeah. Did the yeah, goal uh, of no. remote viewing change over the years? Well, we don't know. We, we just don't know. Do we know where it we, started? We, I mean, do we know what the genesis was of this? Like, who came up with this idea? Well, they called it different things. It was psychic warfare. They called it different things. I, I believe, and you know, I'm speculating and uh, take a little bit of time just to research it, but I believe it started when the Cold War got really um, vicious, which was pretty soon after the Second World War ended. So I reckon this started in the late 40s, early 50s. Curious. You know, when, when the Manchurian candidate the, the, the film came out, and then uh, JFK was shot while the film was in release. The film was pulled, like overnight, the film was pulled. Hmm. And a lot of people still think that Oswald was a Manchurian candidate. Oh. So that's another aspect. I mean, the militarization of this hypnotism, you know, remote viewing, blah, trigger these people. But, the, but that's so uh, that, the 63, when JFK was assassinated, there was a ton of this, all this kind of research going on, mind control research going on. So it's a, it's a huge subject, and, and uh, you, your questions are good, but I don't have the answers because it's so huge and because it was wrapped in secrecy. But it's very interesting that, for example, Morehouse and these people who were in the military doing top secret things were allowed to publish these books. And there was never an announcement there was never an official announcement from, for example, the Department of Defense, a press release saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we were doing remote viewing. There's nothing like that. <laughs> but what there was were these books started coming out. 
Did you ever ask them where they thought the program would be if it kept going? No. No, because there was no real... Because they were given specific missions, you see. They, there was no, like, broad overview of this. These were, like, soldiers on the front mm-hmm. sent into a situation. And do they all know and, and trust each other? I mean, do they all sort of... Some of them uh, knew each other, and some of them didn't know each other. Some of them disliked each other. I mean, it was just like a group of people. You know, there's nothing extraordinary about that. And what do you make of Ingo Swan? Well, he's one of the... Uh, you know, I think legit remote viewers. See, for, I keep hearing that. You always hear he was one of the the best psychics and all this. And and when last I, I knew, I'm he not was... sure, and I don't want to say anything out of order here. So let me preface this by saying I don't know, but I think he was one of the original ones involved in Scientology. But I'm not sure. Yeah, so huh. that'll be on the net. That'll be on the Google <laughs> for sure. <laughs> well, I just know that he. Everything's on Google. I just know that he, in later years, got depressed and sort of became a you know reclusive person because he is just at this point waiting for the world to end. Uh, but it's just interesting that he believes what he saw that much because anything that I read about what he's seen doesn't seem plausible to me in terms of you know aliens on the moon and this sort of thing. I know it get they always got, got in, increasingly far out. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I got to wonder, if you're doing this stuff a lot, if you're in the military and you're doing this stuff a lot, and say you get out and say you write a book on this and then you start teaching people how to do it, I have to wonder if there is not some kind of adverse reaction in the mind from doing this so much. I mean, I, I, I have to wonder if there's not some kind of psychosis that can happen uh, in, in practicing something like this too much. I think they'd have to be. I think they'd have to be. Some kind of side effect. I mean... Yeah. The stories are similar. They never actually tell us the value of what they did. And I don't think they're allowed to. I think they was that someone said, okay, write a book, but you can't say what you know really happened. Right. Well, I mean, it, what, what's interesting to me is that this, in your estimation, started not long after the Second World War. And so yeah. I look at that and I go... I think everybody at this point is, is, especially in our listenership, is probably aware of some of the History Channel specials that have gone into the, 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 the Third Reich and the occultism that, that existed. And I have to wonder if there wasn't some kind of connection there as to that, um, that, that belief in some of the higher echelon of uh, occultism and mysticism and all of that, if uh, psychic warfare or the pursuit of remote viewing didn't somehow kind of get amalgamated you know into that you mean in nazi germany yeah 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 but but the, well, but know, the thing uh, i think about that is is that you've got that uh but then when we bring in other words there had to have been something to it that was very substantial for our military to go all right we need to take this up we need to we need to uh, start a program we need to get this going uh, because this, you know, if it's not valuable, it's just like a corporation. If you bring a project to the table that's not going to make the company money, they're not going to fund it. <laughs> and so, no, somebody no somewhere, question. I don't think there's any question that, that that there's something to it, and that there was a lot to it. I don't think there's any question about that at all. And then, uh, regarding Nazi Germany, you got to keep in mind, and I've made a study of Nazi Germany, a few films and everything, and I really know quite a bit about it. You have to remember with Goebbels and Hitler that they were the ultimate cynics. And I'll give you a fantastic example. Goebbels knew and Hitler knew that millions of people, a huge proportion of people all over the world are superstitious and, and believe in astrology and all this stuff. They knew that. So Goebbels uh, rewrote Nostradamus he put Hitler in it as Heidler. And they published that in something like 48 languages in you know, the mid-30s. And those, that Goebbels edition of Nostradamus is still the edition most people read. And everyone still says, oh, isn't it amazing? Look, Heidler, that must be Hitler. So a lot of this... A lot. They, the Nazis would use anything if they thought that a whole lot of people thought. If they thought they could get an advantage by people thinking that they were like into satanic magic, then they go. They'd get some Gestapo team to go out and talk about satanic magic. So, 
the Nazi thing is a double-edged sword. I don't. Th I think they were just incredible cynics, and all they and they were all they wanted was power, and and you know they they had their fifteen minutes. Well, and you know, do I, you think uh, do you think Heinrich Himmler was uh, legitimately in any of that? Himmler, I think Himmler was more on the wacko side, and I, yeah. you know, he thought he was a reincarnation of uh, Henry the Fowler or something. Right. Uh, and he was the, the Gestapo. He had the Knights of the Round Table, his version of it, and all that. But I don't think Hitler and Goebbels were at all. I think they were just using everything they could uh, uh. to control people. Because there is Hitler, that uh, there is that tale of a psychic that had given. Uh, Hitler a, a a root of some kind and uh, mandrake or something yeah yes yeah and he was supposed to to hold on to this thing for you know as long as he wanted it. in other words the Reich would last as long as his connection to this root remained but then uh, I, I don't remember if it was Kristallnacht when they killed him or not but a lot of psychics were rounded up and killed yeah uh, you know self-professed psychics at that point so I I, I mean that kind of like turns the story on its ear a little bit for me. Well, I think that really sort of backs up what I'm saying. I mean, I think yeah. these people were useful to them for a while, and then if not, just, you know, knock them off. So you think it was more or less a, a, a fear generation tool more definitely. than anything? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, the Nazis even went so far as to, uh, in, in the Middle East, I've just been, uh, there's new research has come out about what the Nazis were doing in the Second World War in the Middle East. And they were working with Islamic scholars and people who were sympathetic to the Nazis to uh, imply that Hitler was a kind of a prophet an Islamic pro in the Islamic tradition. So they were, they were using even that. They were using that. They were saying, you know, the America... Uh, and uh, Britain uh, and the communists are all run by Jews, and it's all, a, a, you know, Jewish, the whole thing's a Jewish conspiracy. But uh, Hitler is defending you against all these people. And, but, but this is the sophistication of their propaganda. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think you can... Uh, but they were researching everything. Yeah. But they were hardcore. So that's why the drug thing was important, because that was a chemical thing that they could actually control people with yeah well the uh, fact that you've got an unlimited supply of uh of people to use as lab rats i mean that's yeah i mean certainly they they did all that plus some uh in some of the really sadistic crap that they did but certainly i mean you could get uh, i i mean barring any morality you can get a lot of work done uh, they, got, they got a lot of work done yeah yeah so uh so they weren't looking for the ark of the covenant <laughs> well, you know, I, I think some of them were. That yeah. the, the, there was some SS, There was an SS group that were doing all this weird stuff. Uh, part of the uh, Aryan mythology that the SS had was that, for some reason, Aryans started in Tibet. So they sent an SS expedition to Tibet, and they met the Dalai Lama. And they said, there's a film about it. It's a Nazi film. You know, going all the way up the mountains to, and they were measuring skulls of Tibetans in Lhasa and stuff. I mean, it's hilarious when you see the movie. So they were doing all this stuff. I met a Navajo, uh, the wife of a Navajo chief in Vienna at a conference in, uh, I don't know, early 90s maybe. And I said to her, Oh, I've been. Do I did a documentary on Nazi Germany called Swastika. I found Eva Braun's home movies in the Pentagon with my researcher Lutz Becker, and and she told me this amazing story. She said in 1938, these Nazis showed up in New Mexico where she was living, and uh, they were these Nazis. <laughs> These Nazis had Navajo interpreters, and they were asking the Navajos what is what do they think the origin of the swastika was. And they showed her the swastika, and she said, well, I know what this is, but you've turned it around the wrong way. That's really bad. And they said, what do you mean? And she said, well, you, you can't turn the sun around like that. That's really bad, because the Nazis had turned the Navajo swastika around. Right. Great story, I think. And 
uh, but that's what they they were in America interviewing Navajos in '38 on on you know the mystical stuff. But that's the Heinrich Himmler research department. Uh, so that's that's where he was the most active was searching out that kind of stuff. So so he was really the whack job for all, all of that. Uh, right, yeah, the origins of Aryans. Right, and, right. Uh, origin there, you know, and when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, they did absolute uh, cartwheels to, to explain the backflips, explaining to the German people that the Japanese were Aryans, but the Chinese weren't. Oh, jeez. Oh, Unbelievable. How do you explain, and maybe you just did, <laughs> maybe all of this is the explanation, but how do you explain our sort of Nazi fetish that we still have to this day? I don't think it's a fetish. I, I don't. I think there are unresolved questions as to why that war started, how it started, who was backing Hitler. I think it's very convenient. I, I've just been in Berlin at Humboldt University, Berlin University. Um, my film Swastika was banned in Germany until last November, and uh, they finally showed it poignantly at the university where my father was kicked out in 1933 because he couldn't prove he was Aryan. But to answer your question directly, the, the unresolved questions are, are pretty big as to who really backed him. You know, uh, no one likes to talk about it, but the whole British establishment was pro-Hitler and the whole American establishment was pro-Hitler. It was just lucky, I think, that FDR took a visceral distaste to him, as did Churchill. Their class, the class of FDR and, I mean, social class, and Churchill were all pro-Hitler. It's very convenient for everyone that Hitler's committed suicide because he can be blamed for everything. And, and, and I think it's kind of, it's very dangerous, this blaming everything on Hitler because it's made him a bigger myth than he actually was. I mean, you can't kill 50 million people without help. I, just, I, I also, just in little ways, find odd things like the fact that they're still an Aryan nation that there's, you know, they, they run a certain sector of the prison system. And, um, I mean, you don't have, like, an Attila the Hun <laughs> identity, you know? Like, why, no. why, what is it about Hitler and about Nazis that people so over-identify with this many years later? Well, the scale of the crimes. I mean, there's, there's been genocide, that's for sure. Before there were genocides. Before, as Hitler pointed out, you know, there's the Armenians, and I mean, it's but the the, the industrialization of murder, I think, was so startling and still being abs absorbed. And if you're a moron, you can be impressed by that. Yeah. If you've got a low IQ, you can really be impressed by, oh wow, geez, they killed. Or maybe there's something to that. Maybe there is something wrong <laughs> with the Jews and the Gypsies and the gays. Right, uh, but it, but you know, the, it was a bizarre, bizarre thing. Well, and, I, I, I mean, uh, I know it's the industrialization of racism, uh, of racist murder. Uh, there's a yeah. big difference, and I think that's why. Uh, that's why when you say why is there a fetish, I don't think it's a fetish. I think it's people who are like, how did this happen? And if yeah. you read the if you read the studies of it, no one really knows. It's just yeah. there's many theories. Well, well, it's it's. The, I mean, at least for me, when I was back in high school and early college years, I was, I was fascinated by it, and I was saying to myself, "How is it that an entire country can be put under such a spell as to to you know not only not claim to know what was really going on, but also to participate in just what you're saying? How does somebody do that? How does that happen?" I mean, well, this gets we're not stupid our, people, this, you know? You know, I think that that's a really good question because that gets back to our original conversation or at least the center of our conversation about mind control mm -hmm. because no society had been, no society previously had been subjected to a total media control that the German people were after 1933 and more than that no one knew what media was but the right. the Nazis had radio going spectacle in rallies, newspapers, film, and they even had television uh, from 36 on, not in pri in, only in the private homes of rich people, but they had television in post offices and public television. There was, a, there was total control, and they invented this whole idea of networks now. You know, we have the Internet, 
Goebbels invented the radio network. Goebbels had a switch on his desk. You've you got to realise these guys were young. Hitler was like as young as JFK when he took power, and Goebbels was younger. Mm-hmm. And so they were into all this new mass media. Goebbels had a switch on his desk in his office that he, he could put, push the switch. Uh, the uh, uh, President of the United States can't do this now. Goebbels pushes, pushes, turns a switch and speaks into a microphone, and every radio in Germany gets his message. He's talking to everyone on the, uh, with one switch. We can't do that now. So you're talking about why did it happen? I think that's one factor. Total media control never happened before. No one even, people thought movies were incredible. And then there's a drug element that we, there's only just starting to be analyzed now. Some people believe that there was amphetamines were put into the water supply at the Nuremberg rallies and so on wow. and so forth. So huh. you combine all that, you know, um, it's, it's, it is a fascinating subject. And, you know, it's not that long ago. That's why I think, I think it's a healthy thing that people are still interested in it. I mean, I don't think it's healthy that, the, you know, the uh, uh, half-wits think it's great, but, uh, but, I, but I do think it's an example of government gone mad. Here's yeah. your little factoid of the day. Uh, you know who was a, a huge student of uh, Nazi propaganda? Michael Jackson. Well, that's really? Yeah. yeah, and now you go back and you look at all of the, you know, especially in the 80s, the footage of him running with an army... And, you know, all of that sort of action figure looking stances. and Yeah, I always thought that was that. a bit odd, actually, that military dancing thing he was doing. Well, I always thought that was a bit odd. Yeah, well, but it worked. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. sure worked. Oh. Hmm. There's a very interesting exhibition on in Berlin at the moment called Hitler and the German People. Because, this, you know, the swastika symbol itself is banned in Germany. You can't publish the swastika. Right. And... This museum got permission to show swastikas, and so the, 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 the exhibition's about the social life at that time. It's a huge, very successful exhibition in a museum. Well, what was the reaction to your film? Really good. Uh, but really? Particularly the new generation. Well, I don't know how much you know about my film, but the, 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 we revealed Eva Braun's home movies for the first time. Mm-hmm. This was 1973, and since since then, every documentary ever made about Hitler has some of that has scenes from my film in it, from swastika with even all the color stuff of Hitler, right? From you know swastika, and the I didn't have narration because I assumed I didn't need it. I assumed everyone knew that um, Hitler was a bad thing. Ending up in, uh, as I mentioned before, about 50, arguably 50 million people died in the Second World War because of what Hitler started. I didn't know that at the time that um, that was open to debate that it was a bad thing. So I made the film assuming everyone believed that it was a bad thing. And that was, you know, kind of controversial. The, when the film was shown at Cannes, and it's a long story, I'll try and be brief. When the film was the official UK entry in Cannes in 1973, like pandemonium started when people saw Hitler in colour. People hadn't seen Hitler in colour, let alone it filmed in an informal home movie kind of way. And fights broke out. Mm. And there were German distributors in the audience in 73, and they said, this film, if French people are fighting, what, imagine what happens in Germany. We can't show this in Germany. So it became the famous film in Germany that they weren't were never allowed to see, which you know is kind of crazy. And other countries stopped it too. It was shown in the U.S. in uh, in L.A. and Washington and a few other cities. It was shown in Australia, France, and so on. To answer your question specifically, the younger generation of Germans they thought it was fantastic. They said, "We now we understand about we." Now we understand, because Hitler looks like a normal guy. So we've only seen that ranting, yelling Hitler, and we've mm-hmm. seen Hitler in the home movie excerpts in documentaries, and we've seen the Holocaust, horrible Holocaust scenes, and we've never seen the whole context of it. We've oh. never seen how this guy looked normal, he played with kids, so you went along with him, and he had, you know... So the reaction was very moving, actually. I had... A lot of young people, like I'd say 18 to 24, saying, yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, it's valuable to know that uh, that evil could be your next-door neighbor. <laughs> I mean... Uh, Listen, most serial killers are good-looking. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's be honest. At the time, you know, Hitler looked pretty much like every other guy. Um, I mean, we we view him as this iconic visage of, you know, uh, the uniform and, of course, the mustache and all of that. But, I mean, he wasn't an amazing-looking guy. He wasn't uh, – he certainly wasn't out of step with uh, – uh, with with what the style of uh, a man's grooming in Germany would be at the time, so and 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 not only that, he was much younger than all the other world leaders. Yeah, and that yeah. was attractive to young people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and uh, you know, for a while, the, what he said worked. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you say, the caref- carefully crafted uh, image and propaganda, and uh, I, I mean, I, I think you, you look at any. Uh, uh, any leader that's going to use a skull and crossbones and black uniforms, you know, I, I think, I think oh, on some just level, so far out. No, when uh, that's it very is, good, when, it's really far out when you look at it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I just, I can't, <laughs> I can't conceive of that. You know, being, uh, and and, and I mean, nobody's going to sit back and lie and say that. Uh, you know the photography of all of these things, uh, like the. Uh, Stadium in Berlin, uh, when the they had Hitler all these style films. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, that was people, really you well look done. at that and go, "Wow, that's not unimpressive." No, that's impressive. You know, you no, know, it's uh, very well done. I spent a day with Albert Speer. I don't know whether we discussed this when we really? talked last. Did we? No, no, you did. He was um, uh, Hitler's architect, and he designed those rallies, and a lot, a lot, and he became Minister of Armaments. But I asked him, and you know, I was very young when I met him, so I was no threat to him, obviously, and I was asking kind of naive questions, which in retrospect was probably good, because I said to him, what would you do if Hitler walked into the room now? This is 1972. Uh-huh. And he said, if Hitler walked into the room now, I think that his force of his personality was so strong that I'd be compelled to do what he asked me to do. Really? Well, that was just, that was just bloody amazing, because if he'd said that at Nuremberg, he would have been hung. Yeah. But he, but he did say it to me in 1972. We're getting way off the subject here, but uh, but the the other Nazis I met, and I met quite a few in the course of researching that, the true believers all said, oh, you know, the fear had an incredible magnetism and so on and so forth. But the people who met Hitler who didn't like him, who I, I also met some of them, like Lenny Riefenstahl's sister-in-law, who thought he was just a horrible they said there were two reactions to meeting hitler the first reaction was oh my god what a genius and the other reaction was jesus this guy's like this homeless bum i don't get it really it was just like yeah like a like a like a weirdo and and there were those definite two reactions you wonder what kind of effect the propaganda has on people long before meeting somebody like that you know, uh, uh, all, I, I mean, if, I, I, you, you look I, I, at some of those po- those posters that they did of of him back in the day, and, and the statues, and and all that. I mean, you have to I wonder. I think it's if, huge. Look, it's marketing. It's yeah, why, exactly. You know, people tremble. It's when when people tremble when they meet a movie star now. Even absolutely, absolutely. And you know, they they uh, most of them are, you know, not that impressive as human beings, and some of them are. <laughs> but I mean, but the. Yeah. Uh, the, the force of marketing and all that stuff, it's very interesting. Well, I mean, we certainly see the force of marketing in ufology. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> you know, no, to bring this true. whole thing back around again, I mean, you certainly yeah, see no, it. Yeah, no, it's true. Look at, the, look at you know, the ho- Hollywood and UFOs are deeply related. Yeah. And those early UFO movies, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and I yeah. think they're, they're very important in imprinting in people's minds. Yeah, yeah. Well, and certainly, and, uh, I, mean, that's, I mean, you know, as a, as a as a thought, I don't know whether we're winding up, but if we are, as a as a thought on that, it's a, it's always struck me that the aliens that people say they see mm-hmm. uh, are always sort of humanoid. Yeah, and there really is absolutely no reason why an alien life form would be humanoid or even arrive in a in a flying saucer. Right. But it yeah. just doesn't. It, it, we we anthropomorphize. We well, that's the word, isn't it? Uh, yeah. We we anthropomorph. We, yeah. We that thing. <laughs> we do that. We make everything like us. But really, there's no reason why anything should look like us. I think it's our our ego is, is uh, our mass ego is saying that if aliens are here, they're going to be some form of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I, 
that doesn't seem logical to me, but I'm just uh, well. I mean, I'm amazed. Uh, yeah, I'm amazed how uh, you know popular culture uh, in a show which not I would say not long after I got seriously involved in this, uh, you know, the X Files was busting, and uh, I was. I was pretty amazed. I think I actually had been into it for a while, seriously, when, when the X-Files hit. But at any rate, I mean, it was amazing to see how people's opinions of the UFO subject changed based on the X-Files thing. I mean, you get somebody yeah. in who, you know, who, who, who had a UFO sighting and, and immediately, you know, any guy smoking cigarettes standing around and had any white vans following you. And I mean, all of that stuff, lift, it lifted literally right out of the series. And so it becomes part of the tone of the discussion as time goes on. I mean, I, I remember getting immensely sick of it and going, guys, that's a TV show. <laughs> yeah. Know? Uh, but it is amazing how all that the media does affect. It's uh, powerful. Human, human, it's human really, public perception. really powerful. Absolutely. And uh, then you get, you know, the, the, the conspiracy theorists saying, well, the X-Files was approved by a secret department. <laughs> right, exactly. And the CIA, because yeah. they've got the aliens, and they want to they break it to us gently. Right, indoctrination. For a TV show. Right. <laughs> yeah, we've been hearing that way. since the early 80s, you know. Yeah, and, Absolutely. you know, like, why would they do that? And, like, because, you know, we're so dumb, we need a TV show to tell us. I, you know, there's all this. It, it's crazy stuff. They always say that, and then these shows that are supposed to indoctrinate us or make, make everything sound evil and fearful. So that's, I don't know what they think they'd be accomplishing by making us afraid of aliens. <laughs> yeah. I know, because we're so stupid that <laughs> there's the really smart people in the government who know how to deal with us. <laughs> Well, you know, Whitley Strieber uh, is working on a sequel to Communion, so I think I, I think it's time you give him a call again because uh, I will. But he's done a few already. No, I know, but he said this one is like you know, he's calling it a sequel to Communion. It, it's sort of his, you know, sort of there was final memoir. There's been there's been quite a few, so right. I'm, I'm eager to. Uh, find but if this out is what called he's... Communion Two, will you direct Communion Two? That's that's what I'm asking. You say hi, me. <laughs> and more importantly, will Christopher Walken be working in this picture? Because <laughs> that's all we need. Yeah, no, I, uh, I certainly have so. Uh, How do we make this happen? And yeah. uh, any howling sequels in your future? <laughs> Not in the near future. What I'm working on is the life story of Salvador Dali. Oh, cool. Who, you know, talk about surrealism and uh, issues of uh, reality. Uh, I'm working on that. We're hoping to shoot that in uh, July in uh, in Cologne and Germany. And it's a $15 million movie. And it's in 3D, and right? Shoot, it's, it's called Dali 3D. Yeah. Oh, awesome. And then I'm finishing up The God Files, and The God Files really is about most of the issues we've been discussing with uh, a humorous tone. In the movie, that sounds great. See, I, I look at you on IMDb, and I think there is a prolific director. I mean, you've got Swastika, you've got uh, The Howling Two and Three, you've got you know Salvador, you know Dolly 3D. I mean, that alone is the resume. You know what I mean? Like that's it's quite well, a resume you. you've built up. Well, thank you. Actually, there's a someone sent me a some movie buff sent me a, a site. Some guy did the twelve weirdest moments in Philippe Mora movies. <laughs> and it was some blog somewhere and he said the funny thing was he introduced he said this is the 12 weirdest moments but it's not really in Philippe Moore movies uh, it's in four of Philippe Moore's movies because I had to stop after four <laughs> <laughs> oh boy well, I think he's, one of his favorites was the exploding dwarf in Howling 2 <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I don't think it gets much better than the Alka-Seltzer man dancing up to Christopher Walken's face as he laughs hysterically. Well, that, uh, that appeals to me, I have to say. Yeah, that's the my little favorite. little blue guys. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's my favorite. Yeah, well, that, uh, that was that was great. Uh, you know, the uh, I have very fond memories of making that film, but one of the great ones is going with Chris to a... Alien abduction therapy, not a therapy session, a meeting of uh, abductees. Right, a sport group. Mm -hmm. And in New York, 
just after uh, Chris agreed to do the picture, and I really reproduced that scene in the film. Wow. When those, you know, there's people there, and uh, but when I left the meeting with Chris, and I said, you know, what do you think? He said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Yeah, that was what I wanted to ask you about. I mean, number one, what, what number one, what was it like to work with him? And number two, uh, you know, when he wrapped all this up, had it changed his mind any? Because I've heard him in interviews talking about, uh, you know, how he really he didn't know, but he, you know, he thought it was a little crazy. But you know, he seemed kind of I don't know, non committed either way on it. Well, let's put it. Let me let me put it to you this way. He grew up in in a story in New York, in you know tough streets. He didn't buy. He didn't buy any of it. He thought it was possible, but yeah. But he's an actor, you know. Oh yeah. He loved. He loved doing it. I mean, he loved believing it. Yeah. But yeah. his doubt uh, kind of transferred into his portrayal in in the movie. And to me, it, to me, that's what made the movie the fact that this guy was wondering whether he was going crazy or not. Right, right. I think if we'd gone one way, if we'd gone, oh, it's definitely happening, it would have been a week of film. And if we'd gone, oh, it definitely isn't happening, it would have been a week of film. Yeah. Uh, that's why we ended up making it independently. I couldn't get a studio to make it, even though it was a bestseller. Yeah. And the, re and the reason was, I, I, they, kept, they kept wanting me to make it a horror movie. And I said, I'm not going to, I'm not, going to make a horror movie that's not the issue the issue is do these things exist or not right. and they said we're saying you flip you can't make a movie ending with a question mark huh. and uh i said well that's that's what this is and then that's in fact what the book was the original book really was right. well i think you've just gotten to the the heart of the issue with all of ufology that we've been talking about for the past couple of years on this show which is the question mark doesn't sell answers sell and so the the term unidentified or unknown gets completely lost in the shuffle. It gets answered, and that answer is, by definition, uh, untrue. Yeah. No, I think that's I think that's right, and I, I I think it's very interesting that it is still a question mark, a flying question mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I gotta say that um, when I bought uh, Communion on DVD after hunting it down, and I got the special edition when they. Uh, uh, you guys inserted the the outtakes at the end uh, of the DVD. I have to say, uh, I the, the the shots of of uh, Mr. Walken sitting cross legged on the floor in the uh, in the alien waiting room, trying on different rubber alien masks, mm. is is enough to make anyone run screaming from the room. <laughs> I mean, well, that actually, I mean, that scene is in the movie. Yeah, yeah, but there were more outtakes of it. There were more <laughs> yeah. outtakes of it. Yeah, and yeah. some of that is just and it's just chilling stuff. And I and I still to this day say that you know your film, you know it. it I mean, and, and this is no reflection on your work whatsoever, but no one's ever going to be able to match what that experience is like uh, to a degree. But I think that at least, if nothing else, I think that that. Uh, that your film and the way the surreal nature of it. I mean, this was the first film to ever really tackle into that. I think you portrayed it so perfectly. Um, well, it, it's as good as anyone's ever going to get, I think. And, and, well, and amazingly enough, very... with, amazingly enough without CG. <laughs> no, mean, thank you very much. And you know what? The surrealism is an interesting aspect. And in connection with UFOs, I don't know whether this, this ex expression is, still being used and i don't know who originated it but high strangeness yes mm -hmm. there were people saying that they were that someone was designating experiences as, uh, as being of high strangeness mm -hmm. and i would have called the film high strangeness except that you know we had to call it communion right right yeah well i think you don't i think i, I think that. if we're talking about meeting alien beings and crossing into other time zones and parallel universes and whatever, all the whole thing. It is going to have to be very strange when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know if I asked you this last time you were on or not, but uh, did you, uh, did you or any of the crew have any kind of weird experiences when making this movie? I think you did ask me. Um, one guy ended up in the uh, in the San Fernando Valley. 30 miles from where we were shooting, but we right. didn't know whether he was abducted by aliens or whether it was an alcoholic blackout. Right, right. 
Uh, but um, that glib answer aside, there was nothing really, I can't say there was anything really strange, hmm. unless I blocked it out myself. <laughs> my, experience, my, my only really strange experiences w- were when I was with Whitley in his cabin. And I think I told you about that when we last spoke. Yeah. That I, I had had this uh, very vivid nightmare, which Whitley didn't believe was a nightmare. I thought it actually happened, but I had this very vivid nightmare of uh, the, these uh, uh, alien, uh, that very old-looking alien smiling at me, and uh, suddenly I was out of the room, the light shining all through the windows in the cabin. I was taken to a, a strange lab where there was like skinned animals in like huge test tubes. Oh. And uh, there was a light in the swimming pool, and so on and so forth. But and I, I woke up convinced I'd had this. You know, I was just about to make the film, so why wouldn't I have that nightmare? I was in the cabin, right? Right, you're totally in the mindset, right? Yeah, totally. You know, and hmm. the lights in the coming through the window could have been the electro, the electric lights. The Whitley had um, lights that were triggered by animals. I guess the security around the cabin was every bit as portrayed in the movie. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. Was Andrew uh, privy to any of this? I mean, did he know all the stuff? Yeah, was going he did. On? Yeah, no, he did. And that that there was the scene in communion where you know he says to his dad, "I'm seeing these lights and stuff," and and Whitley uh, gets upset and thinks it's confirmation that's all actually happening. So I don't know. I haven't seen Andrew for he's a he's a adult now, and um, I haven't seen him then. But he was privy to it. Yeah. Geez, I I almost feel like we're missing a question that should wrap all this back up to remote viewing. But that's probably well. I impossible. think remote viewing is an integral. You know, it's part of the same league, shall we say? It's all part of it because remote viewing was the military euphemism for time travel, astral travel, the channeling. They were remote viewing people into uh, alien spacecraft and so on and so forth. It's all it's all wrapped up in the in the same subject. Right. Paranormal, supernatural, exactly. yeah, extraterrestrial, or fact. Done. 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 <laughs> well, that's the flying question mark comes back at us. Indeed. Thank you very much for uh, yes. for giving us your time and coming back on the show. No, look, I really enjoy talking to you guys. It's great. Yeah. Ditto. You know, and uh, you know, I wish I could be more articulate on some of it, but uh, it just is is certainly endlessly fascinating to me. Well, we hope to uh, have you back on again, and um, we'll be looking out for the God Files. I can't wait to see Thanks. what you end up doing with this flick. And and well, Dolly, I, I'll be first in line. I'm a big Dolly fan, so looking tremendous. forward to that in 3D. Tremendous. Well, let me know uh, if there's anything else you know. If you want me to um, pompously speak about, I'll be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> awesome! Yay! <laughs> Thank, <Okay. Laura. laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Cheers. Bye. This is Nick Redfern, and you're listening to Paratopia. Thanks. And it is amazing we didn't get Jacques Vallée to do that. So the Jeff. So the Jer. Philippe Mora came back. Yay. Yeah. Wow, that was all over the place, eh? That was awesome. It was great. I mean, uh, you know, he's just a, a fascinating guy to talk to. Yeah, we covered everything you love. Nazis. Oh, please. Yeah. What? Let's start that. <laughs> yeah, I love Nazis. Ah, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, you're German. They're German. Yeah, yeah. You got okay. a lot in common. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. You both love Iron Maiden. Oh, wait. <sighs> I don't know what that means. Okay. Can we start over, please? No, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> please, I don't need that. I think everyone knows you're not a Nazi. What the fuck? Yes. So, uh, what have we learned here? Anything? I'll tell uh, you what uh, I learned. <laughs> what's that? Uh, Scientology and the government, question mark? Yeah, well, that was pretty wild, huh? Scientology as mind control experiment? Wild. I mean, yeah. I guess I never put that together, but, you know, you're right. I mean, even just on the surface level of creating a cult, that's mind control. But I, I always go back to the conversation that um, 
L. Ron Hubbard had with George Lucas, where he said to George, you know, why aren't you turning Star Wars into a religion? You totally should. But the, the way Lucas tells the story, I mean, it almost sounded more like you should do it to make money and because people are morons. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you know, let's make it very clear that uh, what is it on some census papers somewhere? Jedi is a religion. <laughs> well, that's not his fault. That's Australia's right. fault. Yeah. Okay. It's Australia, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to be a Jedi. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it, it's interesting to look at at, uh, at Nazi Germany and at uh, see. I told at, you. At, well, no. I think it's interesting to look okay. at it in the sense of how um, how essentially one man or a group of people under him can control people. How people can be manipulated. You know, far beyond uh, a measure of uh, morality, good sense, whatever you want to call it, and uh, and and certainly uh, cults uh, that have existed throughout the ages. I mean, that's something that they're all known for is controlling quite easily in some cases their their uh, participants. So uh, I, don't, I don't think you get a better example or one that's steeped in more mystery than than Nazi Germany, and certainly. Uh, I think it's pretty fascinating that that uh, Philippe found the the color footage that God we've seen everywhere. I mean, it's I mean you, you turn on the History Channel, anything on the Third Reich, you're seeing that footage of of him and Ava and her friends and the children and all of that. Yeah, and I uh, think um, everyone should at least go to YouTube and check out the trailer for Swastika because it's great. I mean, he, he shows the footage. The first word on the screen is psychopath. And yeah. then it runs down a list of other things, you know, art lover, mm. dog lover, family man, you know, all the stuff that Hitler was. And it reminded me of uh, what my history professor, you know, impressed upon us in college. Um, and he was, I believe, a Jew who was in one of the death camps or mm. maybe his parents were. I think he was. I think he was a kid at the time. But, I mean, he just told a story just vividly of the soldier, the Nazi soldier, who would commit these horrible atrocities and go home and put on classical music, kiss the wife, all of this. And right. Went yeah. into great sort of actor's detail about the lives of these people to make them yeah. sound just as common as they were, which is what the whole mystery is about, you know? Uh, yeah. Because we like to remove evil and say, oh, that's this thing out there happening to us. And here we have the evil is us. So yeah. how did this happen? Yeah. Well, and and it, and never never think that it's all just propaganda and uh, you know and imagery and marketing. I mean, it's, certainly there was a lot of that going on then. But uh, uh, my aunt's father uh, was murdered by the SS, and um, all for the simple sake that they passed him on the street and uh, and said "Ha, Hitler," and he would not salute. He would not say it, and they uh, essentially made him put his arms up over his head, and they said, when you put your arms down, we will shoot you. <laughs> and so, you know, when you've, got, uh, when you've got that kind of thing going on in the streets, it uh, tends to make you want to follow the rules so you don't, you know, die. Yeah. Um, so there's that horrifying reality that, you know, that this kind of thing can go on and that it can get that – out of hand, it can get that out of control, and people can be that manipulated and controlled um, or inspired, if you want to call it that. I mean, if you want to look at the from, from a, another standpoint, I mean, to be that ruthless, to become that kind of of uh, of population, it's just it's uh, and exactly what you said. This is something that came out of my high school years, where I had a. Uh, I had a teacher, a math teacher, who participated in the Berlin uh, Olympics, and he was a he was a rower. I think he was on a rowing team, and and he, you know, he had uh, a fascination with that as well. And I said, you know, I know why I'm interested in it. Why are you interested in it? And he says, well, because I just want to know why or how this happened. How does this kind of thing happen? Because it is horrific. Um, and I said, well, that's exactly my. My own reason, I just, I can't believe it. I can't, you, you read the books, you look at the history and you go, how, how, how does this happen? I mean, it's, uh, and it really is true. I mean, I, I see this motto, you know, uttered at the end of every, you know, Holocaust, uh, special or, 
uh, anything like that. You know, that, that those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. Um, you know, I think that's uh, I think that's absolutely true. So, never a pleasant subject, but definitely one that um, that ties in with uh, marketing and and branding and all of that. Well, it ties in with the whole you know, thing. I mean, you know, I'm sure there are going to be people who are like, well. How is how does this even apply to the subject? And of course, we're dealing in human consciousness. We're dealing with mind control. We're dealing with uh, you know all the things that you need to talk about before you ever talk about. Hey, w- is that an alien? Right. Uh, now, do you agree with his assessment of Hitler in terms of how he felt about the occult? Really, that he didn't that he sort of was dismissive of it, but using it. Uh, because he knew the people uh, were were tuned into it. I can kind of see it either way. I don't. I don't know. And I mean, certainly Philippe's done a lot more research than I have, and he certainly, you know, uh, made the films and and has had to, to research all this in depth. But um, I certainly could see something like that. You know, you being used as a tool of fear, or um, you know, in, in the altering of Nostradamus's writings, saying that you know this is ordained. This is the future. This is what's going to happen. And this man's been right throughout history. And look what we're finding in his book. You know, he's naming the Fuhrer uh, in the book. And um, and this is our future. You know, get on board. It's all, you know, it's, it's I not didn't only know that. I didn't know that about Nostradamus. Did you? I'm, and he'd said Hitler, but I think it was Hissler, right? Hissler, yeah. I mean, that's I, something I I'd always heard that. is Hissler. And, and you hear even John Hogue, right? And, and mm-hmm. the people who are supposedly the great Nostradamus scholars always talking about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's uh, how much different is that from anything in ufology? If it supports the contention or it supports the the end, then we'll use it. Um, it, it may be completely innocent mistake. It could be the the whole proliferation of more, more, more. It's more accurate. It's you know we're finding out more accurate things about it, and therefore it substantiates their own belief. But I had heard that before. You know, hearing, hearing it from somebody like Philippe is is a little it holds a little bit more water for me. But um, but yeah, I'd heard that they had edited several things, not just that, but um, uh, had injected you know the Third Reich and Hitler and all of these people into positions of you know uh, mythic uh, status, that sort of thing. Like this is ordained, and and so it, it not only becomes a tool of fear at some point and. And superstition, but it also becomes, uh, you know, a rallying cry. You know, this is we are ordained to rule a planet. We're ordained to uh, to do what we're doing, and so it's kind of an absolution of guilt. That you know, this is this is history. This is the way it's supposed to be. It's been ordained. So, I mean, I, I'm not making uh, allusions to Nazism or, or ufology. I'm not making that connection. But certainly, when you look at at popular opinion and how easily it's swayed just by one person. With a lot of "quote unquote" data, I mean, it certainly shows you just how easily people can be swayed into belief systems, um, and it's something to always keep your guard up against, and always to, you know, if you're interested enough, take up the torch yourself and go talk to people and ask the right questions and and find it for yourself, rather than listening to a figurehead, even if that be Paratopia. I mean, you yeah. Know. Well, in terms of the Nazi stuff, I mean, I would like to know. Um, when they started uh, sort of incorporating the occult stuff and all that, because the parallel now, of course, would be what, well, starting with Reagan, really, the Republicans did with fundamentalist Christians. You know, in terms of turning fundamentalist Christianity and having that be synonymous with, you know, Republicanism and and all of that, and, um, you know, the 700 Club and uh, Pat Robertson and all those guys, World Roberts and all those guys sort of, preaching on behalf of a political party, mm-hmm. um, I mean, very clearly takes its cues from this type of thing. Now, I'm not, of course, equating them with Nazis. I'm just saying they no. they learned about propaganda and how to get a grassroots movement on your side. Um, so I wonder, was there a grassroots movement in the same way? Because, they, of course, fundamentalist Christianity wasn't the thing of the day back then. It was, as Philippe said, astrology and mm-hmm. uh, sort of these occult th- superstitious things. Yeah, um, spiritualism and all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was there a, I wonder, was there a fake grassroots campaign that precipitated all of this or did they just sort of dive right into it? I mean, how did they, mm. how did they I, cultivate I that mystique and get people to believe it? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. I, that I don't know. 
I mean, certainly, I think anybody can know that that any sort of you know religion or quasi religion can become a, a really powerful tool in in aligning people. Um, you know, and certainly when you're talking about like Pat Robertson and all of that. I mean, that I, I think I don't know. I think on some level, probably I, I don't I don't know. I hate to say that it would be intentional, but it probably is intentional that you know that religion gets used to 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 uh amass supporters and all of that i mean that's that oh, seems yeah. seems pretty it's simple good. to me you know i mean it's definitely used hey frank zappa was singing about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah long I mean, before it came to fruition you know yeah and uh and so when you're talking about you know nazi germany and uh and all of that i mean i could certainly see them using spiritualism uh, as a tool of some sort not only to frighten people not only to i mean again like i said during the show you know black uniforms with skull and crossbones really you know you're you're cultivating a you know an image there of fear and uh and to be feared um uh, and i suppose that you know if you were a 21 year old male at the, at the time and you're in germany and and all of this is coming up i mean uh just just for the sake of image, you got its sharp looking stuff, you know, you're saying to yourself, This is, you know, you get a lot of girls with that. <laughs> you know. I mean, it it's it's all about cultivating the image and, and the image is powerful and uh and like I said, you can't watch those films uh uh of Berlin Stadium and all of those things without going, Wow, I mean, this was far huger than I ever thought it was and um uh, and the pageantry of it all. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that really inspires people to, I guess, even epic proportion uh, action uh, like that. But anyway, this is a paranormal show. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting to talk about human behavior, and I'm fascinated by it. But, uh, you know, the, the, the remote viewing thing, I, you know, I got to say, even still now, I don't I just I don't know why I just don't find the fascination with it that some people do. I mean, I, I I get the sense that you're in, interested, like you're interested in it. Um, uh, no, I I was interested in it. I mean, I I'd read a bunch of books, um, but the more I think about it, the less interested I become. I oh, really okay. Uh, only because uh, I think the evidence really is that that it's no better or worse than hypnosis at retrieving. Uh-huh. Memory from the collective, as as hypnosis is for retrieving it for, from the personal. Yeah. Well, I, I'll tell you this. Um, a while back, I saw something on TV, and the reason I asked Philippe about the coordinates is, you know, uh, I just I I didn't understand the coordinates, and so I told Lisa one night. I said, D- "Do me a favor." Uh, Give me a, a six-digit number uh, separated in half with a dash, and 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 look at that number and associate it with a place. It could be any place you want, anywhere. And then I want you to give me the number, and I'm going to look at it, and then I'm going to close my eyes and think of that number, and I'm going to see if I can picture the place that you're talking about. But you don't tell me what it is. She was sitting on the couch, and I was in the uh, fart chair, and um, I got. Uh, just like imagining. I mean, this is, you know, this is not dissimilar. I mean, when I talk about images in the mind, this is not dissimilar from what any of you can do. And you get a flash of a place or a a texture or a color or whatever. And I got a blue, like a royal blue. I got a flash of gardens seen from almost overhead, like garden, like very lush gardens. One of them in a, like a round donut shape uh, with uh, like a road going around it and, um, and like a white or very light, light beige gray um, sandstone concrete and points. And so I wrote these things down on a piece of paper and I looked at them and the only thing that I could come up with was Cinderella's castle in Disney world. And she said, you're absolutely right. So does it work or did I read her mind? <laughs> you know, that's the question for me. It's like, I didn't go to that place. I didn't feel like I went to any place, 
But that did absolutely happen. Lisa will attest to that. And uh, oh, and there was also a funny smell. I mean, I, also, I actually got like a smell that that smelled like a carnival. And for those of you who have been to Disney World, you know it, it kind of does have that aroma about the place, like popcorn and candy and uh, hot dogs and and uh, all of that. I mean, um, and when I yeah, <laughs> sicko. <laughs> and and when I read that list, I'm like, that puts me in mind of you know, Cinderella's castle in Disney world. Um, and it just so happened. That's what she was thinking of. So, um, does that assumes that you would get better at the Im- Im- imagining and, and all that as time goes on. And I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, you would, I mean, if, if you kept at it like anything else, you'd get better at, at maybe. See, seeing things. And then the question, so maybe you should. And then that way we can then answer. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I give you something bullshit, will you see bullshit and think that it's real? Like can so that yes, you will see real things, but what are you guessing at? Are you guessing at the 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 image that the sender is sending or the actual place? Well, I think at Dames and the Santa Claus thing, doesn't that pretty much say that? I mean Yeah. But I, I <laughs> but clearly Ed Dames hasn't made that correlation or else he wouldn't still be writing books and going on coast. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that. Hail Bob. <laughs> And all of that. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. I mean, really, I I think my interest um, petered out with Courtney Brown's books because Ah, I read those and I was fascinated. And uh, then when, yeah, when the Hale Bop thing happened, it was like, oh, wait, wait, this is all crap. I mean, it's just like the hypnotically retrieved stuff. It's like, wait a minute. All of this detailed, immaculately conceived work is garbage how is that possible right i mean there's just something about the human imagination that we well there are several things that we don't understand of course one of the other ones is what we were talking about earlier this week privately which is how we think that we're creating things um from our imaginations but then you watch the nature channel and you see no those are things that actually exist in nature yeah you know (laughs) that are like we've just somehow think that we're drawing out of nothing, but we're actually drawing on something and we don't know why. Yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's explain that, you know, we've got what the, when there was a headlamp invented, you know, certainly coal miners back way back, uh, 1800s, maybe, maybe earlier. And then Jeremy was watching the nature channel. I think at this point, everybody's probably seen the footage of the fathoms deep fish that, uh, Looks like something crawled out of your nightmare bin, <laughs> uh, but it's got a headlamp. And when the fish, when it turns on the headlamp, and the little fish come to warm themselves by the glow of this artificial bioluminescence, uh, it eats them. Uh, so That's right. you know, yeah. Is it that fish or a different one that that has the fishing lure? I mean, there are a couple of different types There's of a lure, fish yeah. that have a lure. I mean, imagine if you will the irony of a fish with its own fishing lure. Yeah, yeah, suckers. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. And, and you also mentioned the uh, the thing that drops depth charges to throw off other fish. I mean, yeah, it throws off a bioluminescence. Bombs. It throws off a bioluminescence that it ejects from itself, and then and it goes off like two seconds later, just like right. a depth charge, and it looks just like a depth charge. I mean, it's amazing. And if you look at, um, I mean, just jellyfish down there look like look like some sort of fiber optics. Yeah, and if you look at even coral reefs or or any of these fish going off in the dark, the bioluminescent ones from uh, afar, I mean, it looks strikingly like images of the Hubble. You know? Oh yeah, oh, I, I yeah. mean, all of the, I mean, this this can't all be coincidence, you know. I mean, everything is patterns within patterns within patterns, and so watch me bring this around to something relevant for our show. Uh, getting back to why are aliens bipedal? Um, of course. One answer is that we're making it all up. The other answer is patterns within patterns within patterns that there's something that we don't understand of how they're related to us, but also that you're too scared to see anything else. And so we're dealing with something that can look like the least scary thing, right? Or what am I trying to say? I don't want to say shape-shifting, but I, I think... Whatever it is that they're doing, whether they wear bodies like we wear clothes or they shapeshift or they are not 
made of matter in the first place. Uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, there's something going on where, you know, you said that your beings change from little gray guys to humanoid looking things. Mm -hmm. I mean, just coincidentally, at the point in your life where you're like, well, I want to keep this at arm's length and I don't want to be scared by it anymore. And so along comes less scary arm's length things. Right. I mean, that's not a coincidence. Yeah. But that's also yeah. not human ego. That's not like I need to see this to recognize it, to identify with it. It's more like I need to see this or I'm going to be scared shitless. And so if you want to deal <laughs> with me, you need to not yeah. scare me. Well, I mean, it, it could be that or it could be that, um, you know, whatever. Let's just call this let's just call this alien thing a force of some sort uh, that your perception based on your mindset or your expectation or your uh, desire um, of how you want it to approach or how you approach it. Uh, if that changes, then it follows suit. I mean, in other words, it's uh, quasi perceptual, <laughs> you know, it will adjust to suit uh, the individual, which is again, going back to something Lee said about the entire nature of the personalization of, of the experience it, it, that it's a personal experience as fearful as some of these things can be, um, there are moments of unbelievable awe to it too, which, you know, when you've got one guy on one side of the fence who is, uh, you know, horrified at the very thought of, and then you've got someone on the other side of the fence who is intrigued in awe of, and, uh, uh, and somewhat smitten by, uh, contact with the other, uh, you you know right off the bat those two aren't going to get along, and so is that the genesis of what some of this infighting is about? Is that the perception is as different as we are as people? Neither one is less real. I mean, we used to categorize certain positive experiences as woo, but uh, perhaps for some of those people, the experience is positive, and so th- that's going to facilitate an argument because one side is calling them evil and the other one's saying they're not evil. Um, and both are right. That's the, that's the point. Uh, they're both right. Uh, because they are, or it appears or it interacts in whichever way, uh, whatever you're bringing to the table. So, um, you know, you were talking about the, the, uh, the deep sea stuff looking a lot like the Hubble. And, and I like to think that, um, uh, uh, in my, uh, Sudafed induced coma that I exist in right now, cause I'm sick. Uh, I like to think, I like to think that um, the, the word you're looking for here is fractal, in that we've got uh, things that look like outer space at the bottom of the ocean, and we 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 leave that, we go up through the atmosphere, and we find the same thing. So it's all like one big loop, fractal, rep- repetitive fractal things. And you know, Valet actually uh, mentioned in one of his books about aliens possibly being fractal beings. Uh, in that they are some amalgamation of, uh, you know, in the cycle of uh, humanoid, that they are within that cycle of humanoid. At least that's how I took it. I'm not sure if that's what he meant. But fractal beings, um, something about that sits kind of right in a certain way. Um, But, yeah, I mean, you know, take a rock, pick up a rock, look at it, and now look at it close to your eye. And realize that the rock you pulled off the mountain will lay almost perfectly over top of the mountain you're looking at. <laughs> That's a fractal. I mean, it's, you know, these things are everywhere. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that on a grand scale, you're looking at things at the bottom of the ocean that look an awful lot like star clusters and nebulas and, and, and God knows why. I don't even want to know about giant flying fish with, uh, with headlamps. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, even talking talking about fractals or how about this interdimensional? I mean, it, it seems like when we used to talk about interdimensional, we we talked about um, well, if there are these other dimensions and beings exist there, we can never see them. They're not in any way related to us, right? Right. This is sort of the scientific explanation of it, or at least it used to be. I haven't really kept up with where science is at with this, but. It seems to me that that nothing is like that in in the world at all, and so why would that be? Like everything is an overlapping, and and what is an, another dimension, right? Another interlapping or overlapping or underlapping, right? 
frame of existence. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that way, you know, these we are all related. Everything is related to everything else. I mean, because everything is one. Kumbaya, my lord. <laughs> uh, but on this mechanical right. level that we're talking about, I mean, on the on the oneness level, everything is one. Well, you can't do anything with that. But <laughs> on the mechanical level, um, that translates into everything is interconnected. And um, so what happens if we wake up and realize that? I mean, do, does the just sort of understanding of that bring on some sort of new sight? Does it create the opening that we need, you know, yeah. is, does it open the floodgates? Does yeah. It, yeah. Does it open the floodgates? Just that the mere understanding of that. Is that what we're looking at when we talk about your dude in the cloak? Is that what that being is? Well, I think, I, I mean, I think that I could easily say that, um, upon ultimate realization of what was going on in my life and had been going on and making those, you know, connecting those dots that didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense until, you heard other people mention similar things and then they lead up to this and you finally go, huh, it's this, (laughs) you know, it's this thing I never expected it to be. It's not that I do art and I've got a vivid imagination. It's not that, you know, it's that other people have the same thing. And now I've got this thing that I'm looking at in my hands and I'm going, okay, huh. And of course at that realization is when that the floodgates swung open. Uh, which is essentially when Lee and I met, you know, I told him, I said, my life has turned into a three ring circus since this. And it's not because I'm looking for it. I decidedly don't want to look for it, but it's, it's in your face. It's undeniable. It's ridiculous. And, and in, in many ways, again, I, I, you know, I'll say this over and over until something comes up that says it's wrong. When you have the realization, when you wake up to that, uh, or admit it to yourself, I guess is more along the terms of how it should be phrased, but that is when you're paying attention. You're, I wouldn't necessarily say your ears are perked, but you're definitely paying attention. And if there's nothing else that comes out of these experiences, it's that. It's pay attention. The more you give, the more you get. How many times? It's like a broken record. I'm just going to get a little tape recorder that says that on it. Is it that, or is it, we just need a parrot else. to say it. Yeah. More you get, more you get. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, is it that or is it something bigger? Is it um, is it not just that alone? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm just I'm throwing it out. Um, opening the floodgates and opening doors and all of that um, definitely seems pertinent to the discussion at some level. Uh, but how deep does that go and how long can you hold on to that? I don't know. I mean, I think I think George Hansen kind of – I don't know, swung that a little bit open to say it's all attributable to, you know, anti-structure. You're now out of your routine. You're now out of this. And so, yes, it is opening or it is causing some kind of disruption that and chaos that then facilitates some sort of paranormal manifestation. But again, I'm sorry, George, why? (laughs) You know, I know it's not the productive question, but it is somewhere we got to get at some point. So, hmm. right. well, maybe we should wrap it up there. I'm still thinking about just the mind control aspect of society. You know, mm-hmm. now this has got my gears turning because I rarely do I watch the nightly news because it's crap. But right. uh, I watched a little of Katie Couric today, and you know, the news really has changed over the years because they used to like do news stories, and now it's just like they say. Here's what the government people say they're going to do. Right. Next story. Here's <laughs> that homeless guy from YouTube who's now an announcer for some sports team. Next story. You know, and so it's this mixture of consequential things and inconsequential things, which it's sort of been for the past few decades. But now there's no even in-depth investigation or exploration of what anything means. It's just like 15-second sound bites of people who are making decisions that affect our lives. Here's what they're going to do. <laughs> to the end. No questioning. No, what does that mean? <laughs> right. No elucidation. And yeah. I just think, what does that do to the brain of of a person when that becomes their reality? Because we are, after all, media driven culture. So, yeah, to watch TV respond to the internet, where they've now integrated 
you know, Twitter and Facebook brand yeah. names into newscasts and they uh-huh. have, you know, Chiron running at the bottom of the screen that that has people's tweets right. during these newscasts. I mean, it's just it's fucking ridiculous, you know? Yeah. I mean, at, at this point it's nothing about nothing packaged as, you know, something really important. Right. And so what does that do to p- beings that think which are, which are us? <laughs> Yeah. Well, let me just uh, relate to you a little story that happened last, well, this week or last week? I can't remember which. It was early this week. Someone walks up to me at work and says, so, what do you think about Snooki? And my reply was, what the fuck's a Snooki? Uh, cousin of the Wookiee? No. No. Apparently, it's a girl on... Jersey Shore. I know all about Snooky. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> is it an age thing? Am I too old? I mean, is no, that what it is? No, it's a stupidity because, thing. I mean, it, yeah. it's it's another one of those cultural traps that are, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah. Well, it's, it. Um, you know, I actually sat down and I got to be honest, uh, 10 minutes is all I could stand <laughs> uh, before I felt a trickle on my cheek and realized my fucking eyes were bleeding. Oh, did you watch Jersey Shore? <laughs> yes. Oh, God, I'm sorry. And I, I look at this and I'm like, how does this even get regulated to entertainment? I, I, I don't, I'm out of touch, I guess. I'm out of touch. I'm I'm not hip and cool anymore. Well, this is the thing that I I've been... these days are over. <laughs> this, is, yeah, this is the thing I've been preaching for the last few years, which is that art no longer... Uh, it seems, you know, illuminates anything about us, and we don't want it to. It's like we want to be the TV, you know? It was like yeah. we wanted to watch TV, now we want to be the TV, and we want everything to reflect us. And so reality programming is us reflected back at ourselves. Well, that better na- damn sight not be us. That's all I can <laughs> Well, say. have you been to the Jersey Shore? It's no, us. I don't know. <laughs> there but for the grace of Long Island, go me. Uh <laughs> I mean, I, I just I look at that and I look, you know, and I'll tell you what really pisses me off um, is the notion that has come up. Probably, I would say within the past five years, it's really gotten out of control. But art and music and uh, cooking and all of the things that make life great, all of the things that people are either trained in and study years and decades to become good at, or are naturally born with a talent, is all of a sudden put on television as a competition. And if I see one more fucking show (laughs) that puts cooking or art on the table as something to compete in, I don't know how much longer my big screen is going to last, because I may throw a brick through it. Hmm. I never even thought about that. I mean, yeah, this is right. truly, to me, is truly the most, the deepest level of disgusting to me. Um, and I, I will be the first guy to tell you, I like watching cooking shows. Uh, I really do. And I, it's a competition thing you have a problem with, right? It's a, you're making something a competition that isn't competitive. It's not about a competition. All of these things, food is objective or subjective. It's not about uh you're, you cook better than this guy. Well, yeah, if you cook better than uh, McDonald's, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, there's that. But when you're putting two talented people who have honed this skill to be able to learn to cook and do all these amazing things with food, and you turn that into a competition, I just think it's, it's, it's cheapening the talent. I think even to participate in things like that is to cheapen uh, – your ability to to do something like that. I mean, it's uh, if it's a joke, if it's funny, if it's something like that. I mean, that's funny. That's fun. Well, we're living in, in a hostile war society, so it's like everything's about you know competition and work ethic yeah. at this point. I mean, yeah. aren't these the two yeah. things in 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 our you know given the depression yeah. that we're in or big recession, whatever, and the fact that we've been in war for the last however many years? Yeah. Um, but it's just amazing to me that we would want that reflected back at us because you look at India and Bollywood and it's like, they love all the, the lovey dovey flower musical, you know, Mm -hmm. nonsense because they don't like their reality. 
and they don't want to right. see that reflected back at them on their in their entertainment. Right. We, on the other hand, love to see it reflected back at us. Yeah, well, you, I you can't get enough of that shit, and that's why I do think that we fetishize the Nazis a bit. I mean, I, I understand what Philippe's saying about we we need you know we're trying to still come to grips with it and understand it. I understand all that, but there is this sort of glorification uh, of Hitler and of the Nazis, and I think a lot of that, you know, might have to just do with the occult aspects of it. That Well, yeah, and the, and the assimilation of, like, it's the personification of fear and death and murder. Um, I mean, and I think, at, at least, you know, in America, I think that we are, I think that we are really quite obsessed with that sort of thing. I mean, how many Saul movies do we have now? I mean... Hostile. I mean, have you seen this film? Well, you've seen the uh, Human Centipede. So, what are you talking about? I own Hostile. Oh, <laughs> of course you do. You're talking to the right guy. And, and let me let me go back just a step. Uh, d- don't anybody mistake what I mean by like an art or dance competition. All of that kind of thing at some level is okay. It's it's when it becomes this b- brutality level of judgment. Uh, when you're seeing it on a TV thing, I realize there are art competitions all over the place and music competitions and all that's, that's one thing. But, you know, I think you all know what I talk about when it's, when it's based in reality TV and how harsh these people are treated. Yeah, for. Do you need some snarky, are. no talent to judge you. I mean, that's what right. I love. Well, this is my problem with movie critics too. You know, those who can't direct, you know, critique, but right. I, I think, you know, to go forward now, what you're talking about with, uh, the Nazis and with all this, I, I saw this um, this thing the other night, and you've probably seen it. I told you my new favorite channel is the documentary channel. It was called The Trials of Michael Jackson. Oh, God, really? Here's something you never hear me bring up on the show, Michael Jackson. Shamon. And this was about his uh, molestation trial, I think the last one that came up. And it was about the. It started out to be from these two film, recent film school grads, um, just about how wacky some of the fans were, blah, blah, blah. And then they ended up getting there and finding out wait a minute, these people aren't really wacky. What's really wacky is the media coverage of it and how the media convicted this man long before any trial was done uh, and actually showed, I think, a well thought of reporter. I didn't know of him, but certainly this was a highlight of the movie was as the jury is deliberating, he is recording how they found him guilty. (laughs) Before the story even came out, they have recorded both uh, aspects of the trial. I mean, it was just, and you watch this and you're like, wow, you know, media, you really got to question even what you see, like you said on the news, uh, as having any semblance of, you know what, what? What's really going on? If I was there, what was what was really happening? And, and I encourage any of you who have the Doc Channel, uh, you know, check it out. And if that if that comes up again, um, watch it because it is utterly enthralling as to what these people saw and recorded, and the media reaction to them being recorded uh, in covering the story and how the media kind of slimed their way in as being fans, but yet talked out both sides of their mouth when they were on TV. Uh, it's just it's thoroughly disheartening to see that that kind of behavior. So all of this, you know, media um, reality TV is just it's so far gone. You know, it was amusing at Survivor. I could have left it there. You know, naked man on an island in front of his castmates. That's entertaining. <laughs> I mean, uh, past that, I could have left it there. I don't need Jersey Shore and all of this kind of stuff. But it's really, you asked, what does it do to people? It makes them dumb. That's what it does. It makes you dumb. Because I felt dumber just standing there for 10 minutes in the floor. Um, I forgot how to walk, and I uh, went to drink a glass of milk and poured it into my ear. So um, <laughs> that's what I get out of that. Well, you know, and and thank goodness we have Philippe Mora, who – at least had the foresight and the balls to tell Hollywood, hey, you're not turning this number yeah. one bestseller into a shit horror movie because the question is the thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. could have very easily turned into fire in the sky. Yeah. You know, when you look at a lot of the Hollywood directors, I think, uh, you know, I look at him and I go, that's an artist of film. You know, uh, 
and and there's uh, especially the, the howling two and three. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I look at communion like an art film almost. I mean, it really does have a lot of those kind of feelings to it to me. Um, well, it's all in there. All the, uh, you know, all the background stuff, all the set design is, yeah, it all speaks to mythology and artwork mm-hmm. and abstract realism and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah. I mean, all the yeah. questions are in the film through and through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a great piece of work and, uh, you know, and, and it's not his only great piece of work. That's the thing. I mean, uh, I think this Dolly movie, I'm, I'm pretty excited for that. That sounds wild in 3D. And speaking of which, have you seen Tron, Jeremy? Well, Jeff, that's our time for this week. Oh, no. <laughs> I have not seen Tron. Uh, I can't afford rent. How am I going to see Tron? Oh. <laughs> thanks for bringing that up. See, Sorry. that's such a conversation killer. That's like, you tell a mother joke, then I'm like, well, my mother's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I had sex with your wife. <laughs> His wife's in a coma. But that really is our time for the week. Now, uh, did, you, what, did you want to say something about Tron? <laughs> did, did you want to bring this as even further off topic? Oh, uh, yeah, it's great. Go see it. <laughs> Excellent. I just want to tell everybody that uh, Disney hit it out of the park with this one. I think it's I think it's fantastic. So go see it. All right. Now, visually beautiful, and the chick is really hot. Perhaps this is what they showed Linda Moulton how that fateful uh, day in the 80s. Possible. <laughs> All right. Well, Jeff Ritzman, anything else before we uh, make our way to um, not here? Um, nope. First show of 2011. Oh, yeah. Congratulations, us. How about that? My goodness. And you know our 100th is upon us, and I believe we have someone very special for that episode. What episode is this? Uh, 98? Wow. Yes. We're really, we're really doing this, man. We certainly are. Yeah. How about that? Should we give away the hundredth? Should we let everyone know? Maybe we should. Well, you know how we've uh, been wanting to delve into near-death experiences and the such? That's right. We went to the man who coined the term near-death experience for our very first near-death experience episode. That's right. Dr. Raymond Moody. Excellent. Guest. Looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Uh, big time. Who our 99th is, is anyone's guess. <laughs> but that's right. 100. Right. Oh, I'll tell you what else I wanted to bring up. Um, uh, not to bring it, well, to, to keep on the uh, uh, subtopic this week of world domination, uh, Oprah has launched a new network uh, called OWN, yes. which I think is what she wants to do with the globe. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's the Oprah Winfrey network. And uh, on there, she has uh, an interesting little program called Miracle investigators i believe it's called and if you see that um do yourself a favor and, and catch it and uh, tell me what you think on the message boards or drop us a line at paratopia podcast at gmail.com i watched it last night and it's actually not a bad show um skeptic and believer investigating miracle cases hmm. which was kind of interesting and uh not something i expected uh from the oprah winfrey network so um not a bad show and might I also point out that GHI, otherwise known as Ghost Hunters International, had their season debut last night. I believe it was their season debut with a practically all new crew. And the result, it was good. <laughs> it was a good show. Any of it real? I don't know. Well, was it good? Yeah, it was pretty good. So well, catch it. Catch it and see what you think. And if. Uh, and if we can get anybody on the show from GHI, I think we're going to give it a shot. Because I like to, you know, I think that would be a, a worthy discussion to have about the media and uh, portrayals of, uh, you know, investigating the paranormal on TV. How does that work? So. Very good. Wow. You've got yeah. a whole lot of reviews and recommendations from Jeff Ritzman this week. It's almost like the podcast initiative. This episode of the this has been a really freewheeling discussion tonight, and I've thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it. I must say, as bad as I feel, I really enjoyed this. Uh, well, good. I, I love Philippe Mora, and by by the way, Philippe, can we have a grant? <laughs> yeah. Also, I want to say to Whitley Strieber, um, Philippe said he would di- he would direct Communion, the sequel, uh, if you paid him. You wouldn't have to pay me. 
So I'm just gonna I'm gonna sneak it in there. Oh, I will I will lay down the trump card over Philippe Moore and say I will direct that bad boy for free. I'd like to say to Christopher Walken, you need to take this role and reprise your previous uh, acting excellence in Communion. Yes, I agree. I agree, but I can't say that out loud because I think Whitley uh, didn't like that portrayal of him. However, so publicly I'll say. Uh, no, Jeff, that's a horrible idea. But if you put me on the project, that's pretty much who I'm going to cast. Is that someone there? <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else before we uh, call it quits? <laughs> Let these people go to bed. Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> these these folks have stuff to do. That's yeah. why we're still here. Thanks for listening, guys. As usual, we always appreciate your support and your well wishes, which we got a lot of on uh, New Year's and the holidays. And uh, to anybody we missed, hope you had a, a nice New Year's and everybody made it through the holidays safely. Oh, ditto. I love you guys. So I kind of I'm just chomping at the bit to launch right into this. Do you, do you have any questions or anything before we get going? No, it's just it, when will this be broadcast? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? Okay. No, I just go for it, guys. Uh, okay, happy cool. To talk to you. Three. Two, how long will how how long will we be chatting for? Uh, an hour. Okay. And I'll get I'll get comfortable then. Yeah, get yeah, <laughs> get cozy. Okay. <laughs> Break out the drinks. Yeah. Um, all right. How's it, how's it all going? How's your site going and the broadcast and the podcast? And the, how's it all going? It's going really well. Good. Yeah. Good. So what was that? Just, uh, just as, as an aside, a, a UFO magazine had like an expose on... on. Yeah, in, that was... I wrote what, that. That was... Uh, oh, you, that was you, was it? Yeah. Oh, that was great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I wrote to Bill Burns. I said, you know, about time you got heavy with some of this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree. And when you have we're, no idea. <laughs> we're actually... Um, Wasn't that... The, is that the, 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 the incredible stuff about he please send me your underwear? Oh, yeah. It gets worse than and that. And that, that was just so wild. Yeah. I mean, and then another tape surfaced uh, because Emma Woods didn't remember recording any of this stuff because she was told not to. Um, so she's going through her her old hypnosis tapes, and there's a tape where he's offering to buy her uh, a, a chastity belt that has nails by the vaginal opening that he found in a sex shop that he frequents. I mean, it, it, it just... <laughs> If I had done that when I'd written that article, this would have been game over for David. Schell. I mean, my, I mean, it, this is way beyond Doctor Strange, love, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's uh, let's get on with the show here, and we can get into some of that.